Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Kathy Fitzmorris from the Central Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, The Blue Economy, a Great Lakes Entrepreneurship Opportunity. Your microphones and telephones are currently muted to eliminate background noise during the presentation. We will take questions at the end. To ask a question, either type it into the question box on your control panel, or if you have a working microphone, you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and I'll unmute you. Today's program is being recorded and will be available through WebMQS in the Shared Resources section. So let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce Andrew Del Monte, Business Advisor at our Buffalo SBDC. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, everybody. Um, as Kathy said, today I'm going to talk about this uh, concept called the blue economy, um, which we have sort of taken on as an economic development initiative here at Buffalo State College. Um, and we've also, uh, as I was telling Kathy earlier, we're actually about two-thirds of the way through our first run of a six-week uh, entrepreneurship course that we're offering um, to small business owners through the SBDC. Um, in this topic to kind of give them an overview of what it is, help them to sort of start with some digestible chunks and hopefully um, operate their businesses a little bit differently afterwards. So I'm going to kind of walk through what that workshop is like and what this concept is all about and, and we can talk a little bit about how this might apply in your place across the state, whether you're on the Great Lakes or not. A, a blue economy essentially is all about um, our water assets and how we can leverage them. Um, in a good and sustainable and, and in a way so that we can reuse them um, and how that plays in as an economic driver and how that also down at the sort of ground level uh, really has an impact on, on business operations for almost everybody, but especially those that use a lot of water uh, in their business. So I've got a couple slides here just to kind of orient us to blue economy and what we're talking about here. Um, this is a great book, Water 4.0, that kind of goes through all the history of um, water infrastructure development, starting way back with the Greeks and Romans and the aqueducts. Um, and, and the author, David Sedlak, says there's something special about water. In most situations, it's probably reasonable to delegate decisions about infrastructure to others and form our opinions about the quality of service based on price, convenience, and personal taste. These three attributes are certainly an important means of assessing the adequacy of our urban water systems, but they're not enough. After all, decisions about how we obtain and dispose of water have important implications for our health, the environment, and the long-term viability of society. Uh, here's another little thing that the, the Pope wants us to do this too. So in his encyclical uh, letter where he was talking about the environment, Pope Francis said, um, we know that water is a scarce and indispensable resource and a fundamental right of all people, and, and just sort of overlaying that with the fact that we use it in business operations. You know, what does that mean, and, and how are we being good stewards of it? Um, it's also, we think, um, here at Buff State anyway, it's a risk and an opportunity for our region. Um, Bruce Fisher, uh, a professor and the director of our Center for Policy Studies here at, uh, on Buffalo State's campus, says that the economists and the scholars all agree that there's a greater economic benefit to cleaning water than leaving it dirty, especially here in the Great Lakes. Uh, suddenly, were the politics to get correct, clean water could be connected to the urban revitalization movement, and not just to the urban subsidized developer bonanza, or the urban shout hooray economic development strategy, or the urban millennial narcissist or us movement that gets much internet traffic. Bruce is, is in our economics department, and I love it when he gets snarky like that. Um, and then there's also business on a large scale is very aware of uh, our water use and some of the sort of critical water issues that come about just from there being so many of us and so many of us using water both for personal and, and other business uses. So of 302 of the world's largest companies uh, in this particular report, 50% uh, of the companies foresaw uh, near-term risks. Uh, with 39% currently experiencing impacts such as disruption to operations from drought or flooding, declining water quality, increases in water prices. So these are things that businesses are aware they need to be concerned about. 67% um, of those companies uh, already report on water-related issues to the board or executive committee level of their organization. And 89% of those businesses have developed some sort of water policies, strategies, and plans about how they use water. And, and these same concepts can be applied in medium-sized businesses, smaller businesses as well. Um, just one other 
a uh, little quote here. This is uh, from a, a guy named Andrew Winston, who we actually uh, had the privilege to, to hear speak in Buffalo uh, during the six-week course. So one of the weeks, we decided not to hold a class because we had lined it up on our typical regular Thursday meeting time with an annual event run by our Western New York Sustainable Business Roundtable, which is a group of businesses, large and small, that are committed to developing and implementing sustainability plans for their business, water use. Uh, definitely plays into a lot of that. Um, and so they had their annual uh, business expo where there were uh, vendor tables. I think there was something like 40 vendor tables this year um, of folks who either provide sustainability services or provide financing for those sorts of things or just businesses that provide business services like um, LED lighting and solar panels. And, and there are even some, some folks there that do particular uh, water treatment uh, things as well. And then they had a, a keynote speak, uh, keynote speaker, Andrew Winston, uh, at this Western New York Sustainable Business Expo. So all of our class went there for that Thursday, got to hear Andrew speak, um, and then we continued our class the following week. So this is Andrew uh, from his blog. It says He says, uh, it's often innovators who must lead customers down new paths, showing them new ways of managing a resource and saving money that they didn't know were possible. So in addition to large multinationals such as GE and ITT, there are a number of startups in the process of bringing new technologies to the water industry. Um, and then there's these uh, two uh, competitions that he, he references, Imagine H2O and the Clean Tech Open. And there have been some, some pretty important uh, both green infrastructure, so things like um, permeable pavements and all the way up to just new ways of cleaning water, desalinating uh, ocean water to make drinkable and, and for other business uses. Um, all these things have come from very small startups and that sort of innovation mentality that a lot of our entrepreneurs and small business owners that we deal with have. Um, so there's also this innovation aspect, which is a really huge opportunity, uh, we think, for, for folks who are looking to get into this sector. So that's kind of just some orientation. And then we also tell our uh, entrepreneurs in the class what we're doing here at Buffalo State. Uh, we pride ourselves on being uh, technically, Buffalo is only waterfront campus. We have something called the, I'm going to skip a slide, the Great Lake Center at Buffalo State, which is a uh, water research center. Um, right on the water, they've got boats that go out into Lake Erie and throughout the Great Lakes, um, and they take students out there to do all sorts of um, studies and research into the plant life, the animal life, the fish, um, and then sort of analyzing that with um, the sense of what the impact of uh, our traditional uh, economy that we've used the water for, shipping, fishing, things like that, um, dumping things from our glorious industrial past into the water, what kinds of impact that has both on the aquatic life and then potentially on us also. So we are, you know, we really want to leverage the fact that we've got some great uh, water research um, capacity here at Buff State and also sort of uh, take that in a, more of an educational direction, more of a popular education for our community, and then also an entrepreneurial education um, so that we can do things a little differently next time industry starts sprouting up around uh, Lake Erie and Ni the Niagara River and the Buffalo River. And then uh, this other slide was just kind of showing that of our new buildings, we're definitely pushing toward uh, LEED certified um, uh, policies and practices of these businesses, uh, the Birchfield Penny Art Center, which we built a few years back, um, uses about 50% less water than most other buildings of its type. So we've got some examples we can even point to on campus where we're implementing these sorts of things. So <clears throat> from this, we sort of have this long-range vision of wanting Buffalo State to be known as, as sort of a, a blue economy institution. Um, but we got to take that in little measurable chunks. So the thing I'm going to focus on today is um, the six-week entrepreneurship course uh, that we're offering to clients of the SBDC or just community members and students um, that we started uh, Thursday, February 25th, and we're actually not wrapping it up until March 31st. So we've got a couple classes left, and I can report back on how it ended up going. But so far, it's been it's been really great. We've had a, a full class of, of 30 folks who signed up. We've got a wait list for when we run this class next time because there was enough interest. Um, and we reached out to a pretty wide target market. There's sort of four different types of entrepreneurs that we felt could somehow learn from um, us and from the experts that we bring in about the blue economy and, and could sort of transform their businesses that way. So we broke it down into first existing businesses with an interest in water conservation, sustainability, or 
environmental impact primarily. Um, then we also thought existing businesses that are in water affiliated or traditional water based industries. So everything from tourism and recreation, which has become really big uh, here in Western New York with our uh, canal side redevelopment. We've got you know the the paddle boats and the, and the bikes on the ice in winter and all that stuff. Uh, but then we've got the traditional uh, industries of shipping, fishing, things like manufacturing that use a lot of water, beverage production, beer, uh, and spirits, um, or clean technology and businesses that are just generally in proximity to water sources. Uh, we had some folks come in from our local riverkeeper group called Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper who actually had done a little bit of analysis on a local bar that's within a mile of the waterfront um, and just how some of the water remediation that Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper has helped to get grants for and, and implement on the Buffalo River has made that mile radius around this bar is such a, a more walkable, more inviting community, and it's led to increased sales for the bar. So even just businesses that don't necessarily directly relate to the water in terms of business operations can still, um, just by being in proximity to the water, um, really benefit from better care of, of, of water assets. Um, so next, we're also inviting existing businesses that are aspiring to become aligned with what we call blue economy principles in order to better position themselves in the marketplace, a marketplace that's shifting toward consumers that want social and environmental impact to be part of a business's value proposition. And then lastly, we also invited folks, uh, young and old, who are interested in starting new businesses or have sort of an innovative entrepreneurial idea who just want to to hear about the new market opportunities, things that we might be overlooking uh, traditionally related to water technology or water conservation or sustainability. There's a lot of new business opportunities out there that sort of emerge when you crack open this blue economy sector. So we definitely invited folks who are still at the very early stage as well. And, the, and these are probably 25% of the class each. So we did a good job of sort of mixing um, who ended up uh, attending. So here's, so for, in terms of the rest of the slides of this presentation, here's our framework, right? So I'm going to kind of go through the four general course objectives that we laid out when we were planning the curriculum for this course, which, by the way, we called Entrepreneurship in the Blue Economy, but we're open to better names in the future. Um, uh, firstly, the, the number one objective was get people to understand what the blue economy is, how they're associated with it. Uh, secondly, learn how entrepreneurs can practice the blue economy at their businesses or in new businesses that they might be starting, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a lot of the tools and resources we wanted to make sure they had at their disposal if they want to take this further. Um, thirdly, uh, through creative problem solving, identify business opportunities and design a blue economy strategy. Buffalo State College here um, is very fortunate to have uh, the International Center for Studies and Creativity, which, which is an internationally renowned um, uh, department. Uh, folks come from all over the world to, to take their master's programs and certificate programs in creative problem solving and creativity. And one of our uh, research assistants that, that we're lucky enough to have here at the SBDC right now is in the master's program, uh, Karina. And, and Karina has been helping us to develop little creative problem solving um, sort of bite-sized chunks that we've been inserting into these classes for the entrepreneurs to get them working together, meeting each other, and also sort of starting to chip away at developing a blue economy strategy for their own business just by workshopping it with everybody else in the class. Um, and then our last course objective, probably the most obvious one, is to start to build a network of blue economy leaders and practitioners. We've got some people who are already doing this out there. We've got these 30 new people in the class, and we want to mix and, and mingle them all together. So. So that's the, the premise for this course. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through each of these objectives in a little bit more detail to show you uh, how we did this here and, and how you might want to do this um, at your place if this is something that, that might resonate with you or resonates with any economic development goals of your region. Um, so the first course objective, understand the blue economy. The, the sort of focal points we have here are we wanted folks to gain an understanding of critical water issues, so what the problems are. Uh, specifically in our region. Um, and then we wanted them to become informed about the blue economy more broadly and the expanding opportunities within this emerging business sector. So we brought our uh, uh, blue economy uh, economics expert, Bruce Fisher, from campus here to talk to our, our students for an hour at the opening night uh, all about the serious damage that industry and business has done 
to the water, particularly in Buffalo and Western New York, um, and to our environment more broadly. Um, and just to kind of orient us to what the current situation is, the fact that we've got groups like our Buffalo and Niagara Riverkeeper working to remediate uh, the water and the land near the water, and what that's going to do as far as opening up new um, economic activity uh, in those parts of our city, which you know were all grain silos and warehouses and and smelters and things like that in the past. Um, and then there's become informed about the blue economy more broadly. We sort of uh, took a a, a quick overview of, of the two folks out there who are primarily using this term blue economy um, and we sort of analyze the fact that they're coming at it from different places. So these two individuals are a, a man by the name of Gunter Pauli um, over in Europe who is really interested in the innovation and, and the uh, lighter, quicker, cheaper kind of approach to forming economic solutions that don't cause harm but and also reduce waste, and because of that, also reduce cost for the potential businesses that are starting up. So, uh, Pauli says that the blue economy responds to basic needs of all with what you have, introducing innovations inspired by nature, generating multiple benefits, including jobs and social capital, offering more with less. And he's got some great examples on his website, blueeconomy.eu. Um, it's, it's sort of an open source catalog of all kinds of blue economy business innovations from all over the world that kind of prove his theory here that we can do more with less. Um, we kind of, I kind of categorize his, his model of the blue economy as really being innovation focused, competitive focused, circular economy. So that concept of not doing take, make, waste the way most of our manufacturing and business operations work, but kind of closing that loop um, so that whatever you're returning uh, whatever the waste is, is something that someone else or the natural environment can just use in the in the way that you deposit it back. So it's not anything where we got to put it into a landfill. So concept of a closed loop or a circular economy. Um, and then we've got this other guy, John Austin, um, who's involved with Michigan's Blue Economy Initiative, which is um, something that we sort of take a lot of. Uh, we consider it to be sort of a prime example for, for Great Lakes uh, blue economy approaches. And, and this sentence kind of sums it up from them. Our natural water assets, emerging water education and research centers, and technology-based businesses provide jobs and economic development benefits. He's definitely a little bit more focused on the economic benefits of restoration of our waterways, uh, the research that comes along with figuring out how to restore how to innovate for more clean water, for waste reduction in the future. And he's very interested in this place-based thing. So, you know, we're stuck with this incredible asset that for us in Buffalo, it's Lake Erie. Um, Michigan's got a few other lakes around it, too. Um, and so, you know, we want to focus on the assets that we have and make them something that can really be an economic driver um, rather than something where, where we just dump our waste into. So that's sort of John Austin's approach to the blue economy and Gunter Pauli's approach to the blue economy. It doesn't really matter which of these approaches you focus more on. I think they're both important. Um, and, and last thing I'll say about Gunter Pauli's approach is that he sort of looks at the blue economy as being a step further than the green economy. So he thinks of green business or the green economy as where folks are doing a little bit better. So they're you know, starting to recycle more, or kind of interested in being a net zero company, but they're not necessarily taking it all the way. And blue is where you totally close that loop of the circular economy. So it's interesting to kind of see how these colors can, can mean different things. He doesn't necessarily consider blue to mean it only has to be water-based. He considers it as sort of um, being a highly environmental business. Um, so this is something that we introduced to the class and we keep coming back to this concept of the triple bottom line at your business, so rather than just the, the sole bottom line of your financial bottom line, your profit margin. Um, a lot of these blue economy businesses, the social enterprises that I deal with in my other work here at the SBDC in Buffalo, um, they're also measuring their social bottom line, people, and their environmental bottom line, planet. Um, and so you can look at it as kind of three legs of a stool, like we have over here on the left, but over here on the right, this is something Gunter Pauli would absolutely agree with, this concept of they're actually concentric circles, right? So if the environment doesn't have what it needs to thrive, then people don't have what they need to thrive, and then there's no way we can have any sort of economy if those first two aren't taken care of. So it sort of puts them in priority uh, uh, levels as well. Then we introduce them to this kind of fun concept in the class, the fact that you might be one of these two types of blue economy entrepreneurs. And, 
uh, this has to this is this is very place based for us. So these are two uh, daredevils um, from different eras uh, that. Uh, interacted with Niagara Falls in a way that I never would. So the first is Annie Edson Taylor, who was the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. She survived. Um, and we kind of consider the barrel rider, blue economy entrepreneur, as someone who's diving right into our water problems and maybe coming up with an innovative uh, water conservation solution or, or sort of looking at these new market opportunities and really taken, taken to the water head on. Um, and then over here on the right, we've got Nick Walenda, who recently walked over Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And so the tightrope walker, blue economy entrepreneur, might be someone who's not really in a water-related sector so much, but they're aware that there's this, this serious issue of the water that we have to sort of tiptoe around, tiptoe over. Um, and so people might be coming to our class for either of these reasons, right? Because they're totally all in, have a water innovative idea, or they're sort of just they want to get better at the water conservation aspect, and, and they might be a little bit more of a Nick Willenda tightrope walker. This was kind of a fun exercise for folks to figure out which one they were. Um, so then we had um, some folks come in from our Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper who have been really working toward developing a blue economy agenda for Western New York for, for quite some time. Um, and they sort of broke the blue economy down into different sectors for us. Uh, academia, research, and innovation, that one should be kind of obvious. These place-based and water-dependent businesses uh, might be that bar that's near the water, right? Um, or tourism. Uh, green infrastructure, so that's folks that are diverting water from our wastewater treatment system through things like green roofs or rain barrels or permeable pavements. Because in Buffalo and a lot of older cities, um, we have a, a situation with our uh, sewer is called the combined sewer overflow where when it rains the, the storm drains mix with the sewer drains and then any excess flows directly into the Great Lakes. So it doesn't get treated at all so that's, that's poop going into the water. Um, and so uh, redoing those large uh, infrastructure systems costs millions and millions if not billions of dollars to do. So green infrastructure is a way to divert some of that storm water runoff into, into better situations. And because we've got the EPA kind of breathing down our necks locally as far as our combined sewer overflow situation, there's an emerging market for more green infrastructure, especially with new buildings or retrofits and things like that. Um, we've also got waterways remediation. The actual remediation work is a sector and is you know, a potential business opportunity. Operational water use, so things like manufacturers that might be looking to conserve water. Uh, smart growth and sustainable development often incorporates green infrastructure. It's a way for us to um, use uh, water and our other resources more efficiently. And so that's kind of a part of this whole blue economy concept. And then public policy as a sector is kind of interesting, but it's really a market driver in this particular situation and in a lot of environmental situations as it relates to business. So as policies emerge that that force business or all of us to do things differently, it's going to open up new markets uh, for some of these uh, water conservation, in particular, related uh, businesses. Um, and we sort of broke those sectors up into whether those are more barrel rider sectors or tightrope walk walker sectors. Um, and then we just did this sort of internally, not with the class, but as a good exercise in kind of figuring out what's it going to take here locally for a blue economy to really happen. Um, so this is just kind of a quick ecosystem mapping exercise I wanted to show you, um, where we took all those inputs, all those different uh, sectors, academia, research, and innovation, the public policy, folks like us at SBDCs, finance, because we need money for these businesses, the entrepreneurs who are providing some of the more innovative elements, and then the community-based organizations who come in with an agenda are really interested in these environmental issues, um, and they sort of drive and focus of where these businesses might go. Uh, all that combined together hopefully creates some of these blue economy businesses, and then those businesses are going to tackle um, those other sectors that I just mentioned on the previous slide. So green infrastructure, remediation, operational water use, conservation, uh, place-based water-dependent businesses, smart growth, and sustainable development. And then if you map this all out, I love doing stuff like this. Uh, it might look a little something like this, where you've got the technical assistants, the entrepreneurs, the academia sort of feeding into those blue economy businesses. Um, and then you've got public policy being influenced by the research 
uh, public policy might also be influenced by those community-based organizations who are down on the bottom of this map. Um, and that sort of creates a market for some of these particular types of businesses, the remediation, the green infrastructure. And then hopefully we're finding ways to finance all of these things. And that might be a public policy initiative. See the arrow coming over where we might need to properly fund some of these things if uh, policy is going to demand that we start doing them more in our places. So I think it's always useful to kind of map this out and to see where we are and to see if we've got all of this lined up or not. Because if you just put entrepreneurs through a six-week program but don't line up all of the proper resources and supports around them, you know, they're going to learn it. Some of them might succeed. Most of them won't without the rest of this ecosystem also working together with you. So it's an important exercise, I think, when you're trying something new. Um, so that brings us to our second course objective, which is learning how entrepreneurs can practice this uh, at their businesses. So this is where we spent several classes overloading our businesses with all sorts of resources. No, I'm kidding. Um, but we did sort of really go through this in detail. We had an entire class um, devoted to developing a sustainability plan. And we brought in one of the businesses from our Western New York Sustainable Business Roundtable group, Rich Products, a very large company, uh, food, food company. Um, and we brought in their director of sustainability to tell us about their sustainability journey. They did not have a director of sustainability position until this person took the job uh, seven or eight years ago, I believe now. Um, and so she made it into a real focus of the organization. So it was really great for our entrepreneurs to kind of hear that story. And while they're not necessarily going to have the resources to hire a unique person just to do this, there's still a lot of lessons to be learned from how rich products uh, tackled the concept of sustainability. I also spent some time uh, talking to this class about Benefit Corporation Legal Form, which is a for-profit legal form that allows businesses to, uh, or that, that actually uh, locks businesses in to having to uh, measure and report their social and environmental impact. So it's a way to kind of lock in a social mission or an environmental mission if you have one at your business. Uh, we talked about if that might be applicable for them. Um, we also talked about various assessment tools that can be used to measure the social and environmental performance of your company because you're not going to be able to manage it if you're not even measuring it. Um, and that directly relates to water use uh, is one of those things that ideally you'd be measuring and managing. Uh, we also uh, brought in a wonderful speaker from a group here called Niagara Share um, to talk about clean production and what sustainable manufacturing is starting to look like. Um, and then we just sort of had general resources that we shared, everything from technical assistance in these sort of blue economy areas to government agencies that are related to it. Um, this included some financial resources that might be available, particularly for uh, sustainability, energy conservation, water conservation, things like that. And then actually this Thursday, we're bringing in a couple people to talk about market research and marketing strategies, particularly around being a conscious company because the marketing approach there is a little bit different. And the marketing approach is different than just saying, hey, we're green, which a lot of businesses do, and, and that's come to be uh, known as greenwashing if there isn't anything to actually back up that claim because you can you know, market yourself any way you want to, but if you're not actually measuring these things, reporting these things in the way that benefit corporations do, in the way that we hope these blue economy businesses do, then you know, the, the public, your consumers, your potential employees, your investors don't actually know if you're doing what you say you're doing. So a lot of this, these resources are meant to help a business um, show that there's some actual teeth behind their sustainability plan. Um, so kind of going through a little bit of this um, blue economy in practice, uh, this is a little bit that our folks, our, our uh, attendees took away from attending this keynote speech from Andrew Winston, who came to town during the middle uh, of, of our program. Um, he has this new book out called The Big Pivot. And he's talked about these sort of three different pivots that he thinks resilient companies, uh, companies are going to be able to weather the storm of climate change. Uh, they've really got to take these pivots seriously. So a partner pivot, a vision pivot, where you're looking at sort of long-term science-based goals. Uh, really radical innovation, and then this valuation pivot, um, which is where you redefine the ROI um, calculations to take into account natural capital, social capital, the fact that our environmental resources are finite, and if we keep messing them up, we won't have them anymore. Um, a couple of the other things uh, our class took away from Andrew's talk, small and medium businesses, he felt, were going to be the source of these innovations because it's easier to pivot when you're small. 
Um, he said that linear thinking is good for getting things done, but we need systems thinking, so thinking about all the inputs and outputs of the business, not just what the product is. Um, because our businesses have impact in so many different ways, whether or not we choose to be aware of those impacts is another thing. But um, as resources get used up and as, as customers want businesses to be more conscious of what they're doing, then business also has to start thinking into, in terms of the whole system. Um, and business can't thrive unless people thrive and the planet thrives. That gets back to that triple bottom line approach. Um, this is something uh, that we took away from his talk. He wasn't necessarily talking to us specifically about the blue economy. He was just talking more broadly about sustainability in business. Um, but uh, this came out of uh, the 2016 World Economic Forum. The highest risks uh, that, that the folks at this forum saw for the next 10 years, water crises was number one. Uh, and then he also spent a little bit of time, and we spent a little bit of time in the class really digging into why there's an emerging market for this. And a lot of it comes from the global, global millennial consumers uh, and workforce and investors that are sort of slowly emerging as that age group gets older. So uh, in this recent 2016 Deloitte survey, 87% of millennials believe the success of a business should be measured in terms of more than just its financial performance. That's pretty significant. 56% uh, ruled out ever working for a particular organization because of its values. Um, there's another study that I quote a lot, um, was 88% of MBA uh, graduates were um, willing to take a pay cut to work at a company that had uh, ethical values that aligned with their own. Um, so I, I think this stuff is just really compelling for folks. Businesses, big and small, need to take heed um, what these these sort of emerging customers and emerging uh, potential employees are really looking for. And if you do align properly, you get really strong customer loyalty and uh, employee engagement or employee retention because there's something uh, more than just the money that's drawing these people to your business. Um, as I mentioned, we also introduced benefit corporations, which is a legal status that's now available in 30 states and in DC, New York State being one of them. And benefit corporations um, operate the same as traditional for-profit business corporations, but with what they call higher standards of corporate purpose, accountability, and transparency. Um, basically, they give leaders legal protection to pursue a higher purpose and profit, and offer the public transparency to protect against these pretenders in the marketplace. Um, the benefit corporations have a corporate purpose to create what's called general public benefit, which is really loosely defined as a material positive impact on society and the environment taken as a whole. So you'll see some companies that are really environmental focused who are benefit corporations and some that are really socially focused. Um, so they're giving back to charity a lot or they're hiring uh, traditionally hard to work individuals and things like that and, and businesses that do both social and environmental things at the same time. Um, and benefit corporations can really drill down and name specific public benefits if they want to. Like, I want to specifically help this sector of the population. Uh, so benefit corporations, directors and officers are required to consider the effect of business decisions on not just the shareholders, but also employees, suppliers, customers, the community, and the natural environment. They consider this to be the business's full suite of stakeholders. Um, and it provides explicit liability protection for the directors and officers to consider interests other than just maximizing the profits for the shareholders. So it's sort of a way of a business being able to announce that it's not just going to make every decision um, to maximize short-term gain. Uh, and benefit corporations are sort of held accountable in this by having to publish an annual report that includes a yearly assessment of their social and environmental performance using some third-party standard that's out there. And there's a variety of them to choose from. Um, and this is another good way. It's weird where you're, in this case, the legal structure of the business actually really doubles as a, as a marketing differentiator if someone chooses to use that. I mean, you wouldn't shout that you're an LLC out into the world, but, but telling people that you're a benefit corporation and what that means and, hey, I've got this report where I'm tracking my impact um, can really be a great way to stand out uh, in the marketplace right now. There's also this thing called B Corp certification, which is different than the legal benefit corporation form. So certified B Corporations are certified by a, a private company called B Lab. 
um, that requires the B Corps to take an assessment, just like uh, benefit corporations are required to do, but they have to score a certain number on that assessment. So they have to be doing pretty well in terms of that material positive impact that they're having. Um, and the certification also comes with a, a fee that gets paid annually. So I always bring this up just to kind of differentiate because there's a lot of confusion. Sometimes benefit corps are called B Corps for slang. Um, and then that same organization, B Lab, that, that offers this paid certification also offers one of the best assessment tools for measuring social and environmental impact and it's free for any business to use. Um, these are just some samples of what it can look like once you go through the test. It, it gives you a really exhaustive um, analysis of how you scored on different questions, how that compares to everybody else, and it assesses the business in terms of governance practices, practices involving employees, practices involving uh, your community. Uh, impact and then your environmental impact, which is really where the water, um, the blue economy focus can really uh, come out in, in number form when you're when you're assessing the business. This assessment also comes with a good number of best practice guides. So if the business score is really low in an area, they can pull up one of these guides and find ways to improve their score, find ways to to implement new practices. Um, so those are some of the tools we went through with folks, and then we also spent a little bit of time talking about financing opportunities that are out there that might be a little bit different than just a traditional business looking for, for startup capital or for expansion capital. So yes, there's traditional debt and equity. There's these folks out there called impact investors, which is a growing investment sector who are attracted to companies that are producing these measurable, measurable value for society and the environment beyond just the financial return um, that the investor wants out of the business too. And often they're willing to take a slightly less slightly lower financial return in exchange for knowing that the company is locked in to produce this social or environmental value for the community or for uh, for the world more broadly. Um, there's also micro lenders that, that uh, we brought in who might be a little bit more interested in the impact that a business is having in the community because they're also uh, really involved in the community thriving beyond just you know job creation or business retention and things like that. Um, Specifically for blue economy purposes, there might be uh, some procurement opportunities, so particularly around green infrastructure. If there's a municipality that has a uh, RFP out there for, for implementing green infrastructure at government buildings or in new projects. Um, and the governor does have a, a, a green procurement mandate on the books. Um, which could perhaps be followed a little bit more closely as term, in terms of procurement. But so government agencies may be looking for environmentally conscious product services or building services or things like that. Uh, building services sometimes, you know, if you, even if you hire a landscaper that uses electric lawn care equipment, that can actually give the building more lead points if that's something that the, the building um, is pursuing. Technology incubators might be particularly useful for sort of the, the clean tech, the water innovation aspect of the blue economy. Um, and then there are some specific opportunities out there for businesses pushing more in the environmental area. There's an organization uh, sort of partners with the DEC called the Pollution Prevention Institute. Uh, NYSERDA has some, some rebate opportunities, grant opportunities for businesses that pop up every once in a while. Uh, things related to water conservation and agriculture, um, and then even rebates from municipal energy providers and utilities if a business is looking to to buy more energy efficient appliances or lighting or things like that. And then there's these examples of things that are slowly emerging. Um, Cleveland back in 2010 passed a law giving companies in its local sustainable business program a 4% bid discount uh, for city contracts. Um, and then in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, uh, these certified B corporations or benefit corporations were offered a, a tax credit on the Philadelphia city business tax, which is something we don't have here in Buffalo, so it's not you know perfectly translatable. But a couple examples of how you know these businesses that are obviously producing measurable impacts that go beyond just normal business uh, transactions uh, could be things that that municipalities um, could start engaging in, in giving preference to. So that brings us to our third course objective, which was the creative problem solving aspect. And I, I mentioned this a little bit already, um, but our research assistant has been guiding our class through these four different areas um, with regard to trying to develop at least one little 
blue economy strategy they want to implement at their business. So it might just be reducing water use, or it might be as big as I want to bring a new innovative uh, clean water product to the marketplace, um, or I want to you know, become net zero with my energy use within 10 years, and then sort of walking through the steps of clarifying, uh, idea generation, brainstorming, uh, developing those ideas further once you come up with a couple that you want to settle on, and then creating an implementation plan uh, to actually carry it out. So by the end of the course, uh, by the end of uh, next week, our folks will have at least a sketch of their implementation plan for whatever strategy um, they wanted to tackle with their business. And hopefully they've been working with uh, the class, uh, the other little, uh, in, their, in their breakout groups for the class um, to sort of get ideas from each other um, and from each other's experience. Then our final course objective uh, is building a network of blue economy leaders and practitioners. And we sort of broke this out into both building relationships with leaders in the blue economy, so that's our, our um, guest speakers that we've brought in, um, also the guest speakers we have on our final night where um, we bring in panelists who are already sort of engaged in the blue economy to some way, shape, or form. Um, and then we make sure that, that our class has good access to ask them questions. Um, benefit from networking opportunities with other aspiring or current blue economy entrepreneurs. So that's just all the opportunities of interfacing with the, the folks in the class together through these creative problem solving ac activities and through some networking activities too. Um, and then at the end of this, we want them to feel like they've become a member of the emerging blue economy business community in Western New York. It's also kind of a, a call to action, you know, at, at the close of a workshop, which is which is really fun. They're not just getting information from us, they're also hopefully joining something bigger and something that's going to inspire them to, to teach others about this stuff. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got the final night panel of successful blue economy entrepreneurs coming uh, here to Buff State next week. And that includes medium-sized, sort of larger-end manufacturing businesses all the way to small micro-businesses who are doing green infrastructure. And it's everything from uh, place-based business, businesses that are just thriving because they're located on the waterfront, all the way to innovation, research, green infrastructure. We try to give them a good cross-section of, of examples to, to look at and learn from. And then uh, this is something we've instituted across the board at our evening workshops, and it's been really nice. Participants are given an opportunity to network with each other, and the speakers at a loosely organized sort of mixer immediately following each class. So rather than it just being an information dump, uh, we do allow them to, to hang out and talk and get to know each other and sometimes to get to know the speakers if they're willing to stick around too. And we found that that's, that's where a lot of the exciting stuff happens is, is that after the presentation uh, uh, networking. And so that's, that brings my sort of talk to a close as far as what this course uh, was hopefully intended to do. Um, as I mentioned, we've got two classes of it left, so we're, we're getting through it, um, and so far, so good. I think the, the participants are really using the creative problem-solving time, maximizing it to get the most out of it in terms of workshopping their own ideas. Um, we've been really intentional to bring a broad cross-section of what the blue economy could be and is and the resources that might help you get there. Um, and it's something that, that sort of on a more broad level as far as Buffalo State College is concerned and as far as our local uh, economic development drivers are concerned, we're, we're definitely very conscious of our water. It's, it's in our brains, but I think getting our businesses to be water conscious in terms of practices and policies is, is kind of the next step to make sure that, that, that it continues to be a really strong asset and differentiator for, for Western New York in particular. So hopefully there's some relevance there to, to your regions as well, and, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Andrew. Does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to share? All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any. Oh, we good. We have a question. Lynn Oswald. Um, she says, political factions want to weaken the EPA. Do you feel that organization has become out of touch with today's issues? Good question. Uh, I can't tell you. Almost every class has devolved into a public policy discussion at a certain point, which is really interesting because this never happens. We never want to talk about government <laughs> and government intervention at most of our uh, 
small business workshops that we run here. Um, the EPA is eternally way behind and under-resourced. I mean, they've got some pretty um, well-established rules on the books that just communities are not expected to follow because there's no enforcement. And so this thing in particular with our combined sewer overflow is a mainly due to, to our riverkeeper folks and other folks in the region really driving home the fact that we've got to take this seriously has has really sort of pushed the EPA to, to actually follow through on some of these guidelines. But it's always a struggle. I mean if we don't have if we don't have these agencies um, that are, you know, that have our all of our best interests at heart actually, you know, doing these things, it's definitely gonna encourage folks to, to not consider these other impacts. But Hopefully they're not going anywhere. Hopefully they're not shrinking. But good question. And Bree from our Niagara office says, thank you for the presentation. She sees many applications for the agricultural sector. Does that get much focus in the blue economy? It's a really fundamental part. Um, being sort of landlocked in an urban area where we are at Buffalo State, we don't get as much of that. Um, but we do deal with some ag clients. Um, and, but when we talk about water remediation specifically, it's fascinating. We're concerned about all these like source point contaminants of the, the businesses that were right on the Buffalo River right when it um, heads out into Lake Erie, so in sort of downtown First Ward area of Buffalo. But the second most important uh, issue when it comes to the water quality are, are all the the pesticides and fertilizers and runoff and stuff that comes all the way further, further upstream of the Buffalo River um, that comes from agriculture. So it, it is a really vital piece of this as well. Um, and I think ag and, and markets and um, the USDA has some pretty good programs for, for folks who are looking to, to maybe do things a little bit differently. And Andrea from Rockland, she says, um, She's not sure she did hear well. She's met Gunter Polly before, and she wanted to know, will he be a guest speaker here? And I think, Andrew, I think you mean at Andrew's class, or? Gunter's a little expensive. <laughs> OK. Um, so so we, we didn't bring him in. Um, but we've been definitely um, encouraging our class to, to look into his materials. Most of his books and, and resources are all open source online, um, so, so it's accessible to everyone. He's a, he's a pretty wild speaker from some of the, the videos that we've, we've shown, though. All right, thank you for all those questions. Let's see, Andrew is saying, no, not at all. If South American countries can hire them, and I was in charge of that, New York sure could. Mm, interesting. Maybe we'll have to look into that. She says, great investment. So maybe you guys should talk after the webinar. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, if you do think of anything else after, you know where to reach Andrew. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Andrew, for another great presentation. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the day.